It's well known the Mac Redding created The Simpsons, uh, something that is very important to me, and given his first new show in nearly two decades premieres this week, I wanted to go back and take a look at his most overlooked project, the comic strip Life in Hell. Groening grew up in Portland, Oregon. He admits to being raised in front of the television and became interested in cartooning after seeing the film 101 Dalmatians. He also cites Charles Schultz as being another early influence. In the mid-70s, he attended the Evergreen State College. It was here he met and befriended acclaimed cartoonist Linda Berry, whom he would later claim as his biggest inspiration. That's so adorable. In 1977, Groening moved to Los Angeles in hopes of finding a career as a writer. To support himself, he worked several menial jobs within the service industry. It's good to see how much has changed there. And Life in Hell would be born out of these experiences. It began as a self-published comic intended to illustrate to his friends back home what life was like living in Los Angeles. Copies were also sold at Licorice Pizza, a record store where Groening worked as a clerk. He sold his first professional cartoon in 1978 to Wet, the magazine of gourmet bathing. Founded by artist Leonard Corrin, the magazine was a milestone in American graphic design and was instrumental in the development of new wave and postmodern aesthetics. The following year, Groening was hired as an assistant editor at the Los Angeles Reader, a weekly alternative newspaper. The paper began running his cartoons after he showed his work to the editor, and on April 25, 1980, Life in Hell debuted. The strip stars Neurotic Rabbit Binky and follows his anxiety-ridden adventures through work, love, and loss. He is supported by his one-eared, illegitimate son Bongo and his strange girlfriend Sheba, as well as lovers Akbar and Jeff. Life in Hell's humor is very much rooted in alienation, and the characters are often used to express Groening's own angst towards society and its institutions. I particularly identify with the way the work is portrayed, not only as soul-crushing, but as a source of debilitating fear and anxiety. In terms of style, Life in Hell frequently experiments with format. The number of panels varies from strip to strip and can consist of as little as one, though I find it really shines when it completely breaks free of traditional structure. Uh, the way faces are drawn is very familiar, and this is probably Groening's most distinguishable characteristic. From the very beginning, Life in Hell was a hit. In 1984, Groening's then-girlfriend, Deborah Kaplan, offered to publish an anthology of romantic-themed strips in book form. The result, Love is Hell, went on to sell 22,000 copies, and a follow-up, Work is Hell, was released in 1986. It caught the attention of television producer James L. Brooks, who contacted Groening about adapting Life in Hell as a series of interstitials for The Tracy Ullman Show. Fearing he'd lose ownership or have his comic tarnished should the show fail, Groening instead quickly came up with a dysfunctional family, which was, of course, The Simpsons. Despite the popularity and stress associated with producing not only The Simpsons, but eventually a second show, Futurama, Life in Hell continued to be produced weekly, syndicated in 250 newspapers. From the sounds of it, Groening used it as a creative release, vowing it would never end, though Life in Hell concluded in 2012. Had The Simpsons not been successful, I think Groening would be remembered in the same vein as R. Crumb, and by that I of course mean a subversive underground cartoonist, uh, not the other things Crumb has been outed for. For the time, there are some really progressive ideas here, uh, which is why it was such a shame to see his weak response to the recent Apu controversy. Nevertheless, I am very excited for Disenchantment, and recommend anyone who is a fan of either The Simpsons or Futurama to give life and hell a chance. In my opinion, it's Groening's most personal work, and I believe the most accurate reflection of who he is, as an artist, and as an individual. I suppose this concludes our unofficial Mac Raining trilogy. I encourage you to go back and check out The Simpsons Phenomenon in promo and print, as well as my unboxing of Season 3 of Futurama, and apparently a lot of unresolved baggage. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe if you haven't, and as always, thanks for watching.